Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see everybody here this morning in Sunday school class. Appreciate you being out with us. Good to have my mother with us this morning. <laughs> That's why I'm nervous. <laughs> We'll go ahead and take a prayer, prayer request before we get into our lessons. Anyone have a spoken request you want the class to pray about? Yes, can you pray for them? Others? Yes, just hold him up in prayer for sure. Um, others? Unspoken request, just lift your hand. Let's remember all these. Let's join our hearts in prayer this morning. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, God, for another wonderful day that you've given us to come to your house to worship, God. We thank you for each and every opportunity, Lord, that we can take to assemble together as a body of believers, Lord. And we just pray, God, that you'd touch and minister to the needs that's been called out here today, Lord, for these families, Lord, that are struggling, that need a physical touch, Lord, a healing. Father, we pray for them, Lord, and we pray for each unspoken request, Lord. You see each need there, Father. We pray for our lost loved ones, God, that you would bring them home to the ark of safety. And Father, be with us in our service today, Lord. We just pray your anointing upon each and everything that's done here today, Lord. Let it be done for your glory and your honor, Father. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. The title of our lesson today, Live as a Disciple of Christ. We're continuing our unit out of first second third john talking about principles of christian living our central truth christian discipleship means living in obedience to christ and and it's a lifelong commitment and it? it's not just a just a one-time thing and um, our golden text from our lesson first john 2 6 he that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk even as he walked, even as Christ walked. So our introduction in our lesson today, John calls attention to several vital aspects of the Christian life. He begins by reminding us how important it is to obey God. The instructions set forth in the word of God are not to be taken lightly. Obeying them is essential to our walk before the Lord. Throughout 1 John chapter 2, the apostle urges his readers to abide in Christ by knowing and obeying the word which leads to eternal life. So we know from reading the Gospels, Jesus, you know, a lot of times they identified him, they, they would call him a rabbi, teacher. Uh, as he taught, he taught with a purpose. Um, his, and then his call to follow me, uh, to be a disciple, and really to be a true disciple of Christ, we, we have to learn, don't we? We have to learn, we have to be obedient. Uh, uh, Peter Right, you know, add to your faith virtue to your virtue knowledge. So, you know, uh, we need to, to increase at all times. Follow his example in, in the, the way that we are to live. Uh, you know, Paul called it our conversation, you know, our walk. So it is a, it's a daily thing, something we do every day. And today's re, uh, lesson reinforces uh, that idea as we get into it. Um, so to be a true disciple of Christ, we follow his example, which is walk in truth and in love and in, and in light. And we're also reminded from last week's lesson, you know, that there may be times when we do make a mistake, right, or error. And uh, even when those, when we face those times, when they come to us, we, we have an advocate. We talked about it last week. I'll just remind you, Hebrews 4.15 tells us we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he is our, our advocate because he, is, he feels uh, what we feel. So we'll look at that. Today's lesson looks at um, 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 also John introduces us to the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, uh, and uh, the the worldliness and the things that, uh, that that can draw man away from God. So we'll look at all these things this morning. So the first part of our lesson from 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6 says, And hereby 
we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, also, also to walk, even as he walked. So, from our lesson last week, you know, John, the Bible tells us all as well, you know, all sin, yet forgiveness is also available to all. So John, you know, answers the question that we ask, I guess, how do we know? How do we know that we know him? You know, how do we know that we know him? Well, John, you know, says it's very basic. Verse 3, we do know that we know him. We keep his commandments. Obey what he has taught, right? Uh, if, we, if we keep his commandments, we, we know that we know him. And you think about the different expressions that John uses when he's talking about uh, our relationship with God, to, to know him, to love him, to be in him. You know, all these different uh, expressions, you know, describes the kind of relationship we're to have. With, with God through Christ. And, and for Jesus to be our advocate at the right hand of the Father, we must be obedient to him, right? Live a life pleasing to him. And how do we do that? By keeping his commandments. Uh, and you think about, you know, how did Jesus live on this earth? How did, how did he live? He was, Scripture tells us he was fully submissive to the will of the Father, right? Even to the cross, even to death. You know, he, uh, he was submissive uh, uh, to the Father. Uh, and my example and your example is he. He is our example, isn't he? Uh, those who say they know him and fail to keep his commandments, John also identifies them as well and just plainly says they lie, they, the truth is not in them, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when you accept Christ as your Savior, you know he's there, we know he's there, don't we, we feel him, so it's not just, you know, a head experience, but it's a heart experience as well, uh, knowing God leads to obeying God, abide in him, Jesus tells us. Abide in him as he abides in us. And so we have to, we let him abide in us. Don't swallow God's law like castor oil. I mean, he took a dose of that in the springtime. Anybody? Or is that like, was that like a springtime thing? Or I guess it was a thing whenever you needed it, right? Uh, not very pleasant. For when you understand his intent, it will be like honey on your lips and sweetness to your soul. The Word of God should be something that we desire to look to uh, with expectation. I want to know. You know, I want to know. And, and so we have to have that, that mindset, right? Uh, verses 7 through 11. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness, even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, he walks in darkness, and he knows not whither he goeth. So John, remember John had seen many things, you know, from the time, the day of Pentecost, the church, you know, and, 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 and to now, and he's writing these, these three epistles here. And, and he's, now he's seen a time where the church is beginning, you know, or parts of the church is starting to compromise their faith with the world a little bit. And so, so he, he reminds his readers here, let's just, let's just Let's get back to the basics, right? This is not rocket science. Uh, the, the, this commandment is old, but, but it's also new. And this commandment, you know, to, to, to love one another. And uh, 
you think about, you know, when he said it was old, you go back to the book of Levitic Leviticus. <coughs> old Testament law, right? Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And we know that Jesus brought it into the New Testament and, and told us what? A new commandment now I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. We're to love one another as Christ loves us. That boosts it up a little bit, doesn't it? But this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So Jesus' interpretation of that here, you know, love one another as I have loved you. It's a sacrificial love, isn't it? The love that Jesus has, had and has for, for you and for me. And a part of being in the fellowship that Jesus, that John writes about, you know, we're to be in the light, in the light, and we're to live in the light of Christ, and truth, love, and obedience. So John's example, he says here, uh, someone that says he is in the light, yet hates his brother, he's really not in the light, is he? He's in darkness, and uh uh, so light and love go hand in hand, but darkness and hatred also goes hand in hand. And the problem, we talked about it last week sometimes, is people tell themselves that they're walking in the light so much that they actually, you know, they're actually lying to themselves, but then they actually believe it. So they deceive themselves, thinking, you know, that, that things are all right when actually they're not. And, and you can tell by the way they live. And John says you can tell by the way you uh, feel about your brother and sister in Christ. You know, do you love them? Do you hate them? If you hate them, then you're walking in darkness. Uh, and so you walk in darkness long enough, what's going to happen? You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. If you don't believe me, get home tonight. After church, turn out all, all the lights in the house and walk around. See what's going to happen. Eventually, you're going to trip over something or you're going to stub your toe. Ouch, right? You're going to do something. And uh, so <coughs> now there may be uh, things about our brother and sister that we don't like or maybe... Maybe it even irritates us a little bit, right? I mean, for me, some, somebody may be too critical about certain things, right? Uh, maybe uh, somebody, for me, might be, maybe they're too talkative. You guys in the back, don't be pointing at anybody here now, okay? <laughs> so... <laughs> Maybe somebody's too quiet to suit me, right? Maybe somebody smiles too much to suit me, or maybe they don't smile enough to suit me. Well, you know, we still love them, right? And we choose to do that. You can choose to do that. You can choose to overlook, you know, you may call it a fault, but it, you know, for somebody else, it may not be a fault, right? Everybody's got their, their own ways. And we just have to uh, accept those ways. And the love of God living within you will help you overcome these dislikes where we still love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so, and again, you know, think of Jesus as our example. Think about Jesus you know, in the Gospels, you know, and the disciples, and, and you're walking along, and, and uh, you know, you just had, you know, a good sermon on the mount or whatever, and then you, you look back, and your disciples, those, you know, the guys that you've selected, they're arguing over who's going to be at the right hand, who's going to be at the left hand. You know, they're arguing over stuff, right? So Jesus saw this. He saw it in people as well, uh, but he still loved them, right? 
think about Peter and all the things that he did. And, and uh, one time Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. And he still loved him, didn't he? And so, so we can still choose to love um, and desire, you know, to see everybody do the right thing. Um, because Jesus has that same love that he has for his disciples. He's got the same love for you and I as well. So, walk in the light. Be obedient to the word of God. Any comments here before we go on? Forgive them. They know not what they do. Exactly right. The same, you know, as far as going to the cross and being crucified. Uh, yes, he had the same forgiving love for those that, that nailed him to the cross. Exactly right. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. Who, he who says he is in the light, hates his brother, is in darkness until now, right? He who loves his brother abides in the light, there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brothers in darkness, walks in darkness, does not know where he is going because of the darkness has blinded his eyes. Remember, we can, we can deceive ourselves. And the Bible tells us, warns us about that different times, different scriptures, you know, about, about deceiving ourselves. We need, to, we need to check ourselves, don't we? Like David says, you know, um, examine my heart. Pray that prayer. Uh, let's go to... Third John now, the third epistle of John, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> John writes, The elder and to the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, beloved I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as I so prosper it. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. So this short epistle, the third uh, Epistle, third letter of James it is very short, but it's to the point, and it speaks a lot about truth. In fact, those verses, uh, 13, however many, 14 verses, truth is mentioned six times. You know, he emphasizes steadfastness. Uh, he emphasizes hospitality and family. So he's, he's, he's writing this letter to a disciple by the name of Gaius. And now, remember, John had been hearing a lot of some negative things about the church, right? So he wrote some of these letters. Uh, but now he's hearing something good. He's hearing a good report about this disciple called Gaius. And other people had brought this news to him about this person and, and, and how he was living as, as, as a child of God, being obedient. The truth was in him because he walked in the truth. And others testified. This was not Gaius talking to himself about John. This was other people that brought this, uh, that brought this, this message to, to John. And so John, you know, takes time to sit down and he writes him a letter. And, uh, and talked about his hospitality. Uh, it, in those days, as we know, preachers would come around and, and they needed a place to stay. Circuit preachers, I guess, uh, but uh, and and so needing a place to stay, Gaius was one of the ones he would open up his house to him, you know, and you know, and let him let him stay, and be very hospitable to him. And and John declares, you know, this is how this is how it's supposed to work. This is how the disciple of Christ is supposed to 
to act. You know, he's supposed to walk in the truth, and he's supposed to, uh, you know, be a be a helper to those around him to show, you know, others uh, hospitality. And when you do that, John tells us here that we are fellow helpers to the truth. So when we help someone, you know, preaching the gospel or sharing the gospel, you know, if we invest in them with our hospitality, with our finances, uh, with our support in, in prayers, you know, the things that we do, uh, then we, we are fellow helpers with them. We are a part of that ministry. And uh, John's very clear about that here, and it, it kind of makes sense, you know, if you, you know, everybody can't go everywhere, right? You have missionaries that go, you know, different places in the world that you and I, to be honest with you, I probably don't want to go, uh, but, you know, some places you can't go, uh, other people can, and, and so you, you invest in them, and you're a part of that, and that's what that's what John is saying here about Gaius. That since he opened his home, he was hospitable, and uh, and and he he was a part of that ministry. But he, you know, he has good things, good things to say about about this man. So sometimes, if you see somebody doing something good, it's it's not wrong to brag on them, right? Tell them, you know, tell them. Tell them, you know, I see what you're doing. I think, you know, you're, I think you're walking in the truth as, as you should as a disciple of Christ. Uh, so so re, one of the miracles of the organized church is that you can be busy at your daily task right at home and at the same time uh, be preaching or sharing the gospel in Africa, feeding the hungry in Haiti or helping the homeless in India. You can win some victory for humanity wherever you are by, by your tithe, by your support of, of those that are there. Any comments here? All right, now we're going back to uh, John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and verses uh, 12 through 14. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So here we see John writing, you know, you think, well, to, to three different generations right uh, when he talks when he talks to little children new converts you know at the foot of the cross or sins are forgiven and then he mentions young men that are strong uh, you know that uh, that have you know abided in the word and, and and have overcome the enemy and then he talks about fathers you know or those that are you know more mature even uh, and they have known him from the beginning and uh, and for a, a period of time, so three, or you can also look at it not only as three generations, but like three, three different levels of Christian maturity, right? Babes in Christ, growing in Christ, and then, you know, mature and then to the point where you can, you know, disciple and, 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 and help those younger ones uh, under you. So he, he mentions these three levels here. And, uh, and, and so, again, the fathers being examples or, you know, spiritual examples to young believers. So he, he mentions all three of these generations, and then he goes on in verses 15 through 17, <coughs> and he's, he's talking to all three generations here when he says, you know, love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doth the will of God abideth forever. So, so this warning is to all three generations, you know, all believers. And, uh, 
you know, there's no place to stop, you know, whether you're, you know, a young convert, you know, been there a while or, you know, spiritually mature, uh, there, there's no, no place, you know, to let up no matter your level of maturity. We have to continue to walk in the light, the daily walk. Um, John's warning here, you know, he talks about the world and what he's talking about we know is this, uh, a worldly society, we'll call it, um, based on wrong principles, uh, based on darkness, and, and, and based on lies, uh, not on the truth. Uh, now, Jesus was very clear in, in the gospel when he told us what? We cannot serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. You know, so you can't do it. Well, that's, that's what John's echoing here. You can't love not the world. If you're, if you're a child of God, love not the world or the things that are in the world. Because if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. So you've made your choice. You know, if you love the world, then that's your master, and, and, and that's who you serve. And uh, so the things of the world that John is talking about, he places them into three categories, right? Um, and the first one he talks about is the lust of the flesh, uh, and, uh, you know, a, a craving for physical pleasure, and if you think this is not real, then all you have to do is listen to the news, and you will hear that, you know, uh, people doing unspeakable things, you know, and uh, to innocent people, and uh, and you know this lust, you know, that drives them to do that. Uh, so Paul warned us about, you know, the flesh as well in the Book of Galatians. And he tells us what the works of the flesh are when they're made manifest or when, when we choose to love them, then they come alive to us. That's what he's saying. Adultery, fornication, fornication uncleanliness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, draft, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, the lust of the flesh. So, uh, you know, Scripture warns us about those things. And then John goes back and he says, not only do we have to watch the lust of the flesh, but also the lust of the eye. You know, the lust of the eye, an appetite for anything you see, especially things of this world, wealth, you know, uh, possessions, never truly satisfied with what one has. You know, what did the old, uh, some guy asked the old farmer one time, well, how much land, you know, how much land is enough? How much land do you want? And his answer was just a little bit more. That's all I want, just a little bit more. That'll be enough. But then I want a little bit more. So, you know, the, the, the lust of the eye, we have to be on guard Definitely on guard against that as well. Um, now, scripture talked about one fella in the Old Testament. You know, he actually, I think, he, he, everything that he saw, you know, he pretty much got. And who are we talking about? Solomon, right? Because he wrote this himself. He said, whatsoever mine eyes desired, lust of the eye, right? Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I got it. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced within all my labor, and that was my portion of all my labor. Everything that I saw, I got. Well, he tells us the result of that in the next verse. In verse 11, he says, I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do, to do, and behold, what was it? Vanity and vexation of spirit. There was no profit under the sun. If you're suffering with lust of the eye, remind yourself what Solomon did, right? He, he got it, and he tells you. Vexation, right? It is all vanity and vexation of spirit, uh, and that's what it brought to Solomon. And then 
we go back to the third category that John's warning us about here, right? The pride of life. Pride of life. Uh, the attitude of being self-important, seeing yourself above the person sitting next to you. I'm better than they are, right? Self-exaltation. You, you, you take that position and you lord it over those around you. Um, and, and so when you think about that, you know, building yourself up, exalting yourself, it's exactly the opposite of what Jesus says that we're to do as followers of him, right? Um, Matthew 20, 26, but it shall not be so among you to lift yourself up, but whatsoever will be, who will be great among you, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, let him be your servant, Serve one another, right? Serve one another. Let, let God lift you up. So John's warning us, you know, about all these, you know, these three categories, you know, like, that are so dangerous uh, for our relationship uh, with God. It's a, it's a choice for us. And you can choose to embrace this world if you want to. And, and if you do, John tells us what the result of that is in verse 17. The things of this world, like the world, they're temporal. You know, all these things that, you know, that tempt us, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, you know, all, all, the, all these things that temp, tempt us, they're temporal, they're temporary. They will not last. Uh, none of these things in, anchored in this world will follow you to the grave. You'll leave them. You'll leave every one of them. Uh, the consequences of choosing these things are, are just like Solomon. When you get all these things, you know, it's, it's vanity, it's emptiness, vexation of spirit. So, so John tells us then also what to do, right? Um, invest in the kingdom of God, the things of the kingdom of God, right? And uh, these are things that last. Walk in the light. Um, and, and, and anything you invest in the kingdom of God will be an eternal benefit to you. Uh, Jesus told us to lay up our treasures where? Sure, in heaven. How do you lay up your treasures in heaven? You invest in the kingdom of God. You are obedient uh, to the teachings of Christ. And when you do these things, then these are treasures that will last. And you will avoid vanity and vexation of spirit. Any comments here? If loving God with one's whole being is the greatest commandment, then not to do so must be the greatest sin. Indeed, the root of all sin, according to David Hunt there. All right, let's go to verses 18 through 23. <clears throat> Little children, it is the last time, and as you've heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, that they were not all, all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He, hath, he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. So John, the only writer in the New Testament that uses this term Antichrist. Now, the idea of Antichrist, of the Antichrist, or the spirit of Antichrist, you know, the, the, it, it's the New Testament is, of course, full of that. You know, even, you know, Paul talked about it when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, when he said, let no man deceive you by any, man, any means, for that day, that last day, shall not come except what? There come a falling away first. And look, 
that man of sin be revealed. So he's talking about the same spirit that John's talking about here, the son of perdition, because he's describing him, who opposeth, exalteth himself above all is called God or is worshiped, so that he is God, says in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, Antichrist, spirit of Antichrist. So, it, you know, so, and, and John says, you know, these are the last days. I know they're the last days because there's already this spirit of Antichrist because it's, they've already been in, in our midst, in the church at that time. Uh, and it's been loosed. Uh, false teachers, false prophets, evil influences. That's, you know, it's taken part of the church, and 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 of course, evil influences that even we see today, even more and more and more prevalent. The things that go on in our world, society. So yeah, the spirit of Antichrist is uh, alive and well, um, and and them you know, being part of the church and then departed from the church, uh, you know, their purpose was to what? To attack from within. That's why we, you know, we've talked about the fellowship, right? Us. We have to be very protective of it, and we have to be very uh, aware of things that, that come into the body of believers uh, because something, you know, not of God can be, it will be very dangerous, you know, you, you know, a lot of times it's easier to, uh, we expect attack from outside, right, and the enemy come from outside, but when we're attacked from inside, sometimes we can, you know, we can be caught off guard if we're not careful, if we're not aware of those things, so, so be aware of those things, and, and John said those things, you know, even in his day, they were already you know, they were already taking place. So if they were happening then, we know, we know that there, you know, the threat is there for us today as well. So, um, so how do we guard against those things? How do we guard against this spirit entering into the body? Well, fortunately, God has equipped us with that, right? Um, and uh, he has equipped us uh, with that. You know, when he talks about, in verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things, the Holy Spirit will, you know, He will reveal these things to us if we will listen and also if we know the Word. So we have to invest again in, in the Word and, you know, and have the Word in us uh, to, to, to hear the Spirit. And, um, and He, of course, you know, and, and Jesus, you know, told us, you know, as well, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost from the Father will send in my name, look at this, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, so that's where we have to invest, right? Invest our time. Whatsoever I have said unto you, the word that we put in us, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance when we need it. And when we need it is when we face the enemy, right? Uh, the enemy of your soul and my soul. So, and then you go to verses 24 through 29. John writes, Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and the Father. And this is the promise he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things is truth, is no lie, even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in me. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he, that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is both of him. So, you know, knowing the truth, right, um, he, he tells us here, um, to be very aware of, of everything that's going on around us um, and to be aware through the spirit because there's things that can seduce us if we're not, you know, if we're not careful. And the greatest lie, of course, is the de denial of Christ. We talked about that where, you know, people even today say, well, you know, Christ was an, he really did 
he was an idea, right? He was just an idea. He wasn't really here as, as a man on this earth. And we, again, you know, when you hear these things where, you know, there's the di- denial of Christ, then you know they are not of the Father. Because, you know, and, and so deny any part of that truth is to deny Christ and to deny the Father. Uh, these truths, John says, we've embraced them. They're very basic uh, to our belief, to our foundation, what we stand upon. And, you know, they, you, we can't deny those things like that because, that, you know, it, it, it's our strength. And, and the Holy Spirit, again, he will lead us uh, into all truths. And, of course, Jesus tells us here to sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, isn't it? So abide in Christ. Um, and, and when we abide in Christ, we also have that added protection of this fellowship that we, that we have around us, our brothers and sisters in Christ together, a body of believers who abide in Christ. Um, so continue you know doing those things and then the last part of our lesson we go back to the third epistle of John his little short letter right remember he he wrote the first part of his letter he was talking to Gaius uh, and 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 talk bragging on him you know about about you know the his walk in the truth and the light but now I write it to the church, but to Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Sounds like the pride of life to me. He's, lift, he's, he's in the church, and he's lifted himself up. Wherefore, if I come again, I will remember his deeds. But he doeth prating against us with malicious words. What was he doing? Uh, he was threatened by John because John spoke the truth, and, and he, he spoke a lie. So... He, he, because he was threatened by John, he started spreading rumors in the church about the Apostle John. And, and, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and cast them out of the church. He showed no hospitality as Gaius did. And not only that, but those that did show hospitality, he kicked them out of church. He had enough support. He had deceived enough people that he would excommunicate them, right? Uh, put them out. Uh, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So again, that's, you know, the results are what we do, how we live. And just like, you know, John started this lesson out, you know, he said, how do you know? How do you know, you know, that you're a child of God? Well, you know you know because you obey his commandments. You know, you walk in the light as he is in the light. And, and it's a daily walk. We know that. Uh, and it's a, a committed walk. And it's a walk that we can share together, you know, as, as, uh, as, as a group and, and depend upon each other. We appreciate your attention this morning. Looks like our time is about gone.
Welcome this morning. Got a good crowd this morning. Yeah. Well, Wife Beach is here like everybody got the message, got up early. Everybody overslept, hopefully. We are guys. We're just glad to have all that's here. We've got visitors, wanna welcome them, glad they're here. And is that Jeff's mom, your Jeff's mom, glad to have her with us this morning. Good to see David here. Good to have him and his wife. We are. We're just glad to have each one of you. And uh, just we're all here to one thing, to worship and uplift the name of the God. Anyway, and we do. We just appreciate. It. Got just a few announcements, real quick. Do want to announce that the yard sale. It's in the bulletin. Be sure and pick up the bulletin. There's a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, that way you know what's going on. But the, the yard sale has been rescheduled to May the fourth. So those that are planning on having the yard sale to be May the fourth. And also. Uh, all the church leaders uh, got a they prepared a meal back here at the Family Life Center after church. So all the church leaders, uh, uh, be sure and go back there for it. We got a couple of cards here to read. Okay, this says, uh, bless your heart for all the ways you find to be so nice, and bless your hands for giving help without, uh, without even thinking twice. Bless your thoughts for knowing just the perfect thing to do. You are a gift of love and faith. And it says, thank you for all, thank you all so much for all the food you brought to our houses, the phone calls, the visits, the texts, the beautiful wind chimes. We appreciate the wonderful dinner and each of you that helped make that possible after the service. Most of all, thank you for all your thoughts and prayers. During our time of loss, words can't express how blessed we are by the outpouring of love we appreciate from our church family. And it says thank you all from the bottom of our heart. It's the Harold Aaron family. We're blessed, truly blessed for you. And this was from Harold's children. And we've got another here from bro Harold's brothers and sisters. It says, thank you so much. And uh, words can say so little when someone has done so much. But we thank you with all of our hearts. We're going to say thank you for all that prayed, called, texted, and the food. And words can't tell how much we appreciate our church family. And that's for all of us brothers and sisters. Y'all do. Y'all outdone yourself. Y'all are a precious, precious bunch of people. And we thank you so much. Okay, if everybody will stand, we'll start a song service and get started on this. <laughs> See everybody here this morning to worship the Lord. Let's help us sing. There is power in the blood.
Heaven's Jubilee. Some bright morning we shall see Jesus in the air, coming after you and me, joys ours to share. about hunting or fishing, it's about how bad things are. You know, you get tired of it, don't you? Just That's all I talk about is how bad everything, the economy is, the politician. If we could just look past that, Lord, what what a glorious time it would be, because we know what's coming, don't we? And we got so much to thank you for. Go and take up a prayer request. You got any prayer requests? Yes, 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 remember, there's me. Yes, yes, remember Kenny. She, he would love to be here this morning if he could. Just remember him. Okay. Okay. Others this morning. Praise the Lord on that. that that's wonderful. Okay. 
Okay, this whole Sherry up there. Oh, this is Lauren. Remember this, okay. Those. Okay. Okay, let's all stand, just take you need to leave it. Lord, we come to you, get so thankful. As always, Lord, that we can come to you in times of need. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord. Praise report on him things. Lord, we know it's your God of wonders and miracles. Lord, we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we come to you on behalf of these others, Lord, that has a need. Lord, we pray for Kenny with us, Lord. Lord, he left to be here. Touch his body, Lord, with healing. Let's be with him and help him. And Lord, we pray for sure, Lord, that you'll touch her. Lord, each request, we pray for not one request, Lord, nor would we hear that. Lord, you mean so much to us. We got so much to look for. Lord, we're just so thankful with our hearts. Thank you, Lord, and Savior. And Lord, we just pray for the rest of the service this morning. Pray for a great move of your spirit just as you have. We've been having some of the best services ever. Lord, we just ask for another this morning. Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, and say, Still taking receiving first fruits. If you haven't given it yet, uh, we're still taking first fruits offering through the remainder of the month of March, and we would be going to the Southwest Indian Ministries, and uh, they can use it. Believe me, okay. Brother Roger, would you come and pray the blessing over the offering this morning? pray together. Father God, Lord, we thank you for another time that we have to assemble ourselves together, and Lord, just to lift up your name. That's what we want to see this morning. We want to see you high and lifted up. And Father, right now, we uh, lift up each uh, prayer request that's been made mentioned this morning. I pray that for a mighty move upon each one of them. I thank you for the praise reports. God, we know that you hear and answer our prayers, so God, we thank you for that. And Father, for this service this morning, I know you have something in store for us, something special, and we come expecting this morning. We come ready to receive what you have for us. I pray for open and receptive minds and hearts, and let the just uh, outpouring of the Holy Ghost this morning be with Brother Eric as he brings the message this morning. And Father, we just uh, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this service. We give you all praise and glory. And for this offering right now, we just thank you for a continued prayer uh, thing to worship God it's more blessed to give than to receive and we did you blessed us and so abundantly and now we give back a portion to you God we love you we give you praise and it's in Jesus name that we pray amen Stand to your feet this morning. Let's worship the Lord. Amen.
Thank you all so much for your giving this morning. Go start a special singing. Go ask the Stacy family to come sing for us.
you just lift up your hands right now. Hallelujah. Let's just worship the Lord in this house. It's a wave offering of praise right now. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, we worship you. We adore you in this house. We lift up your name in this sanctuary. Oh, God, we magnify you. Oh, God, we magnify you in this house today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's give him praise. Almighty oh, God, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah, he's worthy of our praise, hallelujah, he's deserving of our praise this morning, hallelujah, I feel the presence of the Lord in this house, hallelujah, praise God, if you have your Bibles this morning, just remain standing with me for the reading of the word of God. Let's go to the Gospel according to St. John, if you will, chapter 1. Amen. I want to say it's so good to look out and see each and every one of you in the, in the house of the Lord on this Sunday morning. God's blessed us with another time to come together and to worship Him and to lift Him up. Amen. It's good to have all of our visitors here with us. So good to look back and see Brother Danny and Sister Mary here with us. Amen. Choice service in the Lord, but uh, the Lord gave us a great blessing to pastor while we were at East Bernstadt, and it's good to have them here with us. It's good to look over here and see Brother Jess' mom here with us this morning. It's good to have her here with us. Amen. Amen. Hold on just a second. Hold on just a second, sister. I want them to hear you this morning. Amen. I just want to say, I, I heard Jeff telling some of them one time he was raised on drugs. <laughs> but, but, oh, you have. But, but he was drugged to church. He was drugged to camp meeting, association, anything else that was going on. He got drugged to church. So there it was. Amen. 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 Praise God. I told Brother Jeff. Amen. Sister, I'm going to come over and visit with you because I'd like to sit down and talk about that man for a little while. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1. Please don't forget, leaders, all of our workers, if you work in any capacity in this church, uh, we've got a meal prepared for you after service in the Family Life Center. Appreciation meal for you just to let you know how much that we appreciate the, the work that you do. Because the ministry that takes place around this church wouldn't happen if it wasn't for you. And we just want to just do a little something to say thank you for your service. John's Gospel, chapter 1, starting to read with verse number 19. Verse 19, you have it, say amen. Praise God. And this is the record of John. Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, has said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latchet I am not worthy to unloose. 
These things were done in Bethapara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare bar record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. I want us to go back to verse 29, if you will. Verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of of the world. And again in verse number 36, scripture says, And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Let's pray together, if you will. Dear gracious, divine Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful and so thankful for your presence. God, I thank you, Lord. For the power of the Holy Ghost, God, that I feel stirring in this house today. God, I pray for the remainder of this service. I pray, God, that not our will, but that your will shall be done. In the remainder of this service, I pray, God, for strength. God, I pray that you touch my vocal cords today. Lord, as I preach and deliver your word. And we give you glory and praise and honor for what you're going to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Give him praise this morning as you're being. And see. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. I, I want to preach on a thought this morning. The Lamb is more than enough. The Lamb is more than enough. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, the Lamb is more than enough. The lamb is more than enough. We notice how that John, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, of how that on two different occasions, just in this particular setting, that he, he may notice and he, and he called for the people to recognize the holy lamb of God. Scripture says in verse 29 that the next day that John seeth Jesus coming unto him, he said unto him, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And then just down six to seven verses later, that once again as he was just noticing Jesus, just him walking, that he, that he spoke again and said, Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, he was telling them, I want you to notice the Holy Lamb of God. Look upon the Holy Lamb of God. Hallelujah. For as they were looking to John to be the Christ, he would tell them I'm not the one I am not the Christ but this man the Holy Lamb of God is the Holy Christ the Son of the Living God can somebody say amen but we notice in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament how that it speaks of the sacrificial lambs that for 400 years the Jews had lived in harsh and difficult conditions until God raised up a leader by the name of Moses. He would be a man that would go before Pharaoh with a message from God to, to let his people go. And, and you read the scriptures of how that time and, and time again that Pharaoh would, would turn, would, would, would go back upon his word of how that he would release the people of God and, and was constantly having a change of heart. That 
that Moses would come back several times with the same message to let my people go. But Pharaoh was, a, was an evil and a wicked man that had no intention of letting the Israelites go free. But you read the scriptures of how that God would have a plan that would cause Pharaoh to beg the Jews to leave his land. He would send plagues upon Egypt. But Pharaoh's heart would still be hardened against God. But there would be a plague of judgment that would get his attention. At midnight on a certain night, the Lord would go through the land of Egypt and every firstborn of man and beast would die. Scripture says in Exodus chapter 11 and verse 4 that Moses would say, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of thee and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the meal and all the firstborn of the beast. He says and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt such as there was none like it nor shall be like it anymore but against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that he may know that the Lord doeth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. The scripture says in in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus that they would take blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. For the word of the Lord was I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute for I am the Lord. But notice in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 12 the scripture says and the blood shall be unto you for a token upon the houses where you are and when I see the blood I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You see when the blood of the lamb was applied to the doorposts of each Jewish home God would see the blood and would literally pass over that house but if God did not see the blood he would take the life of the firstborn in judgment he was the blood of the lamb he was the blood of the lamb that saved the people of God that night hallelujah but notice what God told him he said there shall be the blood shall be unto you a token upon your house it's got to be upon the two side posts and over the upper door posts in other words the blood of the lamb must be applied hallelujah don't you know today that the message remains the same hallelujah for heaven to be your home I said for heaven to be your home for you to receive the joy and the benefits and the blessings of God upon your life the blood of the lamb must be applied hallelujah for the blood of the lamb of God is more than enough amen Praise God. The lamb alone could not save an Israelite. Not even a dead lamb could save them. But the blood had to be applied on the two side posts and on the upper door posts to save the people from the judgment of God. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus Christ is our only hope of salvation. He is God's lamb offered for the sins of the world. But the blood of Jesus must be applied to the doorpost of your heart to spare a man from dying in sin. For as the scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, I said, but the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and our risen Savior. I come to tell you this morning that the blood of the Lamb of God is more than enough. Hallelujah. I said the blood of the Lamb of God is more than enough. Amen. Praise God. I notice if you want to experience 
freedom from the bondage of sin. The, the Lamb's blood has got to be applied. I, I preached last Sunday morning on the snake bite. Talked about the antidote uh -huh, for the venomous poison of, of the snake. And, and I've done some more studies in this. And studies suggest and show me that, that the antidote, that the anti-venom, do you know what it's made out of? The antidote for the venomous poison of a snake is taken, it's blood that is taken from a sheep. Uh -huh. The antidote uh -huh, for the venomous poison of a snake is blood that is taken from a lamb. Hallelujah. It is from a lamb's blood. Hallelujah. That destroys the venom of scorpions and other venomous animals. Hallelujah. So even in nature, even in nature, I got the enemy is defeated. Hallelujah. Even in nature, my God. The enemy is defeated. Hallelujah. Thank God for the blood of the Lamb of God. Amen. Praise God. It takes the blood of the Lamb in the natural, even in nature, uh, to cure the venomous poison of a snake. And it takes the blood of the Lamb of God to cure the venomous poison of Satan himself. To cure the venomous poison of the stronghold of sin. My God. Hallelujah. The blood of the Lamb can set a man free. I said the blood of the Lamb of God can liberate the hardest of the hardest of sinners. For the blood of the Lamb of God will set a man free from whom the Son sets free he is free indeed. Amen. Praise God. The lamb is more than enough. I said the lamb, my God, is more than enough. If you're here today and you're broke, busted, and disgusted, the lamb is more than enough. If you're here today and you're lost and you don't know the Lord, the Lamb is more than enough. Praise God. If you're here today and you're empty and you're miserable on the inside, the Lamb is more than enough. Praise God. He is a holy Lamb of God. His reign is righteous. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never fails. I'm telling you this morning, that the Lamb is more than enough. I said the Lamb of God is more than enough. Amen. Oh, God. Notice that they was struck the blood where the Lord said, when I see the blood upon the two side and over the, over the upper post, I will pass over. It's got to be the blood of a spotless lamb. For the scripture tells us in Leviticus, tells us that the sacrificial animals had to be without defense. There is only one spotless lamb. Hallelujah. Only one that is without blemish. Only one, my blessed God, that is white as snow. And that is the holy Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. No other one can take the place that he took. He was a man that was conceived in a virgin by the Holy Ghost. And he's a perfect Lamb of God. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house. I'm going to go to the doctor this week, you know, this call. Yeah. Only one. It was.
was no accident that he was conceived in a virgin. Ah, blessed God. No accident, my ah, blessed God. Scripture says that he came from the Father. Just as Abraham, the father of Isaac, just as he offered his son as his sacrifice upon the altar of Matt Moriah, our heavenly father, hallelujah. That God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. For there's none, I said there is none like him. Never a man speak like him. Never a man walk like him. Never a man live like him because he was a holy Lamb of God. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house. Abraham. Scripture tells us he took Isaac. He took him to the top of Mount Moriah. And Isaac said, I see the wood. And I see the fire. He asked his father, he said, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? And Abraham answered, he answered Isaac, he said, son, God himself will provide the lamb, oh glory to God, for the burnt offering, hallelujah. Abraham built an altar, he laid everything in order, hallelujah. And then all of a sudden, about the time he was going to sacrifice his only promised son, that Abraham looked up and a ram was caught in the thicket. Oh, a ram, a male sheep. Caught in the thicket. He then substituted the ram for his son and sacrificed the ram in this place. From that point on, Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Again, the lamb is more than enough. I said, The lamb is more than enough for whatever you face. The lamb is more than enough. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house oh God now notice it was no accident that the ram was caught in the thicket while they were going up one side of the mountain the ram was coming up on the other side it was no accident that at the moment Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, that he looked up and saw the ram caught in a thicket. Uh, and it was no accident, my blessed God, that Jesus, the holy lamb of God, took our place. Hallelujah. Our God, he took our place as a holy begotten lamb of God. Hallelujah. That we could be free and free indeed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Amen. Praise God. For it's not silver and gold I've been redeemed with. But it's by the precious blood. Oh, I said it's by the precious blood of the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, his blood is more than enough. Uh, you see, the ram was a substitute offering for Abraham. Yeah. Don't you know Jesus died in our place as our substitute? When he paid the price for our sins, the ram points to the Lamb of God. Verse 8 showed that Abraham's faith, that his faith, that his faith so strong that God would provide a lamb. Hallelujah. Verse 13 in Genesis 22 tells us that it was a ram. Praise God. Abraham's statement was really prophetic for telling the day that when the Lamb of God would be sacrificed on the altar of Calvary. Hallelujah. The ram served as a substitute sacrifice 
house, but only the sinless, stainless Lamb of God can take our place. Our God and cleanse us from all of our sins. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house. Just touch the ram was a substitute to take the place of his son. Look at the Lamb of God, which took our place. If you could ask some of them in the early church about the Lamb, they would tell you the Lamb is more. Then enough. Barnabas would tell you, I was sitting on the highway side. I was a poor, blind beggar. Oh, but I heard the presence of Jesus. He not only gave me my eyesight, but he gave me a new purpose to live. He would tell you, oh, the lamb is more than enough. Praise God. Peter's mother-in-law would tell you, the lamb is more than enough. The widow of Nain would tell you, the lamb is more than enough. The demonic Gadarenes would tell you, oh God, when I cut to my senses, I was sitting at the feet of the lamb. I got... I was clothed and I was in a sound mind. He would tell you that the lamb is more than enough. The lamb is more than enough. Amen. Praise God. Oh, God. You see, without the shed blood of Jesus, there is no remission of sin. Only the shed blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, can cleanse a man from his sin. Yes, that makes him more than enough. I said more than enough, praise God. People's always searching for things. Searching for more. Searching for more ways to make more money. Hello, I've got two of you in here. Anybody like money in this house? Well, I've got five of you. I guess the rest of you hates it, praise God. If you hate it so bad, just leave it in the offering plate when you go out, praise God. Yeah. People's always looking for more to do to their life. Planning for more. And there's nothing wrong with planning, but always planning for more. And we forget that it's in Him that we live. It's in Him that we move. And it's in Him that we have our being. We forget that the Lamb is more than enough. Praise God. Hallelujah. The stock market could crash today. The banks could fall apart today. My God. But oh, the Holy Lamb of God. Hallelujah. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And He's not dead. But He's alive. And He lives. And He reigns forevermore. More. Amen. Praise God. Oh, God. <clears throat> He's more than enough. I'm amazed how the John the Baptist, he said, There's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy to untie. It amazed me how the two different occasions he made reference to him as the Lamb of God. The Bible says he, he saw Jesus coming to him and he announced him before he even got to him. 
Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Oh, and the scripture says the next day that he just saw Jesus, just saw him walking. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. There is none greater. I said, There is none greater. There is none greater. I, God, he's a great I am. He is great in might. He's great in love. He's great in strength. And he's a God that is great in power. Amen. Praise God. Somebody give him praise in this house. Oh, God. When you know the Lamb, you'll follow him. That very next verse in verse 37 says that two of John's disciples, after John said, Behold the Lamb of God, that two of his disciples just started following him. When they heard John say, Behold the Lamb of God, they knew this is a man we need to follow. This is a man I, we need to be around. Praise God. This is a man that we need to talk to. Praise God. Hallelujah. I've got if there's anything in my life that I want to do more than anything. That is to dwell. I got in the presence of the Holy Lamb of God. Hallelujah. I've got to have him on the inside of my heart. I can't live without it. I can't function without the presence of the Holy Lamb of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Because he's more than enough. He's more than enough. When you know the Lamb, you want to follow him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Notice, Isaac asked that question. He said, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Now the world, the world would tell you he's dead. The world would like to tell you he's buried. And he's dead. They would like to tell you he's just, just a fragment, just a, a fake fragment of somebody's imagination. But I tell you where the Lamb of God is right now. I tell you where he's at. He's sitting at the right hand. Oh God. Of my Father. Oh glory to God. He's sitting at the right hand of my Father. Oh, glory to God. Just awaiting the release of the Father. Just say, son, go get your church. Go get your children. My God, I'm telling you, he is still the holy, spotless, and sinless, and stainless Lamb of God. He is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. Oh, somebody praise him in this house. That's where he's at. Yeah. We, we get ready to celebrate Easter. His resurrection every day is Easter. Because he's risen to die no more. Oh. He said he would rise from the garden tomb and he did just as exactly as he said, as he, said he would. At least three times Christ told the disciples that he would die and that he would rise again after three days. The Pharisees told Pilate that they remember what he said unto them. He said, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Ah, blessed God. And I want you to know he's coming back just exactly as he said he would. Hallelujah. Because he's the Lamb of God. He's the Son of the living God. Amen. Oh, God. <coughs> it's a lamb. It's more than enough. Why wouldn't you want to follow him? Come here, Brother Daniel. Why, why, why wouldn't you want to follow him? 
Why wouldn't you want to live for him? Why wouldn't you want to serve him? When he's more How many of you lost it that you go somewhere to eat and you pay $15 for a meal and they bring you the fixings of about $5? Anybody like that? You want to get what you pay for, is that correct? Do you like to have more than enough? Where is it? Is it the Pauline place where you go and get and they just keep bringing it to you? Is that, is that where it's at? Is that when you run out, they just keep bringing it to you? Is that? You been there, Brenda? That they just keep pouring it to you? Does anybody like that? I mean, that you just keep receiving. Well, when you follow the Lamb, who is more than enough every day, oh my God, I receive from Him because He's more than enough. I said He's more than enough. I may get weary at times. Stay with me, brother. I, I may get frustrated at times. May get tired at times. But on the inside, my cup is running over. Hallelujah. I may get tired in the natural, but in the spiritual, I've got, I've got more than enough on the inside of me because the Lamb of God is more than enough. Amen. Oh, God. Because he's always feeding me. Always pouring in me. Our kids is getting of age now. That, that they're starting to eat us out of a house. <laughs> you know, I miss the days when these babies. You could just give them a little baby food. That would sustain them. But Xavier, anymore, he goes to the drive-thru. He says, Dad, get me a double cheeseburger. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Zach, even Zach says, Dad, don't get me four nuggets. Get me six now. <laughs> and then <coughs> you can go to Walmart and buy every banana they've got. And Aubrey will eat them. <laughs> Bananas and m and It's what she wants. And it seems it can't, just can't give enough to them. But the Lamb of God is more than enough. If we're broke, he's more than enough. If you're busted, he's more than enough. If you're disgusted about life, he is more than enough. My blessed God. If you're miserable, he is more than enough. If you're sick, my blessed God, you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. He is more than enough. The Holy Lamb of God is more than enough. Amen. Oh, God. Uh, he's more than enough. Yeah. I said he's more than enough. All I've got to do is just follow him. I said just follow him wherever he goes. 
and I'll find him to be more than enough. Praise God. That's the reason Barney missed when he got his eyes out and a new purpose in his life. He got up and he started following the Lamb of God because he knew he is more than enough. He is more than enough for my life. Amen. Praise God. Oh. And time and time again, you'll find that when Jesus blessed people, they wanted to go with him. Because he was the lamb. It's more than enough. Try the piano, Sister Jane. Stay with me. The ram for Abraham and Isaac was more than enough. And the Lamb of God is more than enough for you and I. We talk about the blood. We talk about the goodness of the Lord. The goodness of how that His goodness is limitless. How that is the great I am. We talk about all these wonderful things, but here's the key. The blood has got to be applied. The Lord said, if I don't see the blood, I'm going to take the firstborn of your house. Man and beast. So he was telling them, you've got to apply the blood. We got folks coming. I'm going to preach right here. Got folks coming and they're sitting in church every Sunday morning. But they've not applied the blood. If you want to know what it's like to be free, you've got to apply the blood of the Lamb. If you want to know what it's like to have eternal life, you've got to apply the blood of the Lamb. If you want to know what it's like to have joy at God and the peace of God in your heart, you've got to apply the blood of the Lamb. You've got to apply it. We come every Sunday, every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, sit in the house of God. But until you apply the blood, you'll never know that the lamb is more than enough. But oh, when you apply the blood, when you apply the blood, I bless you, God, this undefiled and incorruptible, you can know that the lamb of God is more than enough. Oh, God. Lamb is more than enough. They can take blood, even in nature, from a lamb. And use it for the antidote of a snake bite. That should tell you, that should tell you alone that, that the blood of the Lamb is what it takes in, in the natural and it's what it takes in the spiritual. Just as I read to you, it says that the Lamb. The blood of the lamb, it, it destroys the venom of scorpions and other venomous animals. That's true facts. So imagine what the blood of the holy lamb of God can do for your life. I said, imagine what the blood of the holy lamb of God can do for your life. your life whole and to make you feel complete and to make you full. Because the lamb is more than enough. I said the lamb 
It's more than enough. I want you to stand with me all over the house. Thank you, Brother Dick. There's no salvation without sacrifice. Sacrifice has done being given so that you can receive salvation. I want every head bowed and every eye closed in this house.